Hello and welcome, I'm Dr. Jack and I've been getting uh, several requests to do a video about the new Johnson & Johnson or Janssen COVID-19 vaccine that actually just got approved by the FDA. So here in the United States, that'll be the third vaccine that has been, now been approved. There is the Pfizer BioNTech one as well as the Moderna. Those two are mRNA based. And let's dive into the details of the Johnson & Johnson one because there are some nuances that make it different and there are some advantages and disadvantages to it and we'll kind of dissect out each of these and jump straight into it. As always, if you're new here and you like what you see, please be sure to hit the likes button, the subscribe button, and also the notification bell so you know when my next videos pop up. And for those of you that watch my videos, sorry, I'm running out of t-shirts and because I've done so many videos at this point, but uh, I'll see what else I can kind of dig up. But uh, they, you might start seeing uh, recycling of some shirts in the future. Without further ado, let's just jump straight into it. Okay, so welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm gonna start off this video by playing a clip from my previous video that I did about the mRNA vaccine and how exactly it works on a cellular level. And once you've seen that, that'll kind of give a primer and we'll kind of go from there. The mRNA stands for messenger RNA, basically sends a little bit of a message. And so it is single-stranded as opposed to double-stranded DNA and it carries genetic material. And they were able to isolate the little bit of the genetic code, the mRNA part within the virus that codes for a specific protein. And that protein is for the spike protein. So what is a spike protein? The spike protein, if you can imagine this being the COVID-19, spike protein are these little knobs on the outside. So imagine that this is a cell and basically what happens is that the coronavirus comes along and uses a spike protein to attach and then ultimately get into the cell, hijack the material in there to start replicating and then kind of bust out of there and the process just keeps continuing. So what scientists have been able to do is take the genetic material that codes just for that spike protein. And so imagine that this piece of messenger RNA has that little bit of material. And what they did was to make it stable, they wrapped it in a, what's called a lipid bilayer. Um, in my previous video, I call it like a pigs in a blanket type thing, the little hot dog treats. And just imagine the doughy part in the middle of the, is the hot dog and that's the messenger RNA there. And so it's brought along and basically what happens is that your, it then gets engulfed by your cell and goes into the cytoplasm. What the messenger RNA is, does is that once it's inside the cell, it actually stays out here in the cytoplasm. And there are other components in there called ribosomes that will basically read this and just imagine this being sort of a recipe, if you will, and the ribosomes is the chef, and basically it cooks up what it needs, and in this scenario, it creates the little spike proteins that it will then present to your immune system, and then basically you have all these other cells that come in called B cells and T cells, and it creates a memory just for that spike protein. So that in the future, when you get infected, uh, or if you get infected or presented to the virus, what ends up happening is that your body immediately recognizes the little spike protein and because it formed a memory to it. So then what happens is that when your body sees the coronavirus, it has antibody and it attaches to all of the spike proteins and prevents it from binding and buys your body time to essentially destroy the virus. You can think of the messenger RNA as sort of like your modern day Snapchat, if you will, right? With Snapchat, you sort of send a message out and it gets seen or read and basically then it sort of disappears. That's what happens here is that the message RNA is delivered into the cytoplasm of the cell, it's read and then it disappears afterward. It gets destroyed by the body but the memory is left there. And so now that you have that sort of basic understanding, how exactly is the Johnson & Johnson Janssen uh, vaccine different? What ends up happening is that rather than having the lipid bilayer actually encompass or surround the mRNA and introducing the mRNA directly into the cytoplasm of the cell, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, the way it works is that it takes the shell of an adenovirus, the adeno26 virus to be specific. And essentially the way it works is that, so you have the cell as you saw previously and you have the 
nucleus, which is where your DNA sits, and out here is the cytoplasm. Previously, you'd have the mRNA come in into the cell, and we just kind of work out here. And the mRNA would come in into this area, and you have these things called ribosomes that attach, and basically it starts to read the mRNA and then tr presents to the surface of the cell the spike protein for your body to basically recognize. The way that this is different is that now what happens is this is not directly mRNA, it's actually DNA. And it actually needs to go into the nucleus and then turn into mRNA and then ultimately come back out to this area here. And then the ribosome attaches and translates it and puts it out on the cell. And so that is the fundamental difference here. It still codes for that spike protein, but it has to go through an additional step. Okay, so for those of you that are interested, I'll put a link down below to this PDF form where it is the FDA briefing document on the vaccine and the details. It's a pretty lengthy document, uh, approximately, I think, 62 pages or something like that. But, uh, you know, for those of you that want to know more, uh, please feel free to check it out. So first off, just to get some of the details out of the way, the definition of this study of efficacy is whether or not participants did not get moderate or severe disease. And the study was conducted in the US, Brazil, as well as South Africa. And they did that on purpose because of the fact that these new variants are popping up with the mutations. And so they wanted to see if it would have any effect on these new uh, strains of the COVID-19 virus. And here are the ingredients within the vaccine. Uh, you can pause the video if you like and just kind of look over all of the ingredients that are within it. So here are details on the shell essentially that they use or the carrier mechanism to introduce the genetic material for the spike protein into your cells. Uh, rather than using the lipid bilayer that was used for the Moderna and Pfizer vaccinations that was mRNA specific, in this scenario they use the adeno 26 virus or adenovirus 26 um, and basically put the genetic material in there and then introduced it into the cell through that manner. Now, the adenovirus is made inert or ineffective and unable to cause any type of infection. Uh, just think of it as a car, if you will, and you're gutting out the inside of a car to basically deliver a particular substance. And as you can see here, it was used in the Ebola vaccine approved by the European Medicines Agency back in July, and it's been used in all kinds of investigational vaccines in the past and as of December 31st of 2020 there's been it's been used in over 193,000 participants in clinical trials and deemed safe. Now to get into the details of the study it had a very good sample population of over 43,000 participants and as you can see here it was split quite evenly through the group that was vaccinated as well as the placebo group. And as far as the participants, this was done in age groups of 18 years or older, and over 30% of the participants were over 60 years of age. And as you can see in detail in regards to the demographics, it was uh, including a wide variation of various ethnicities as well. And as far as comorbidities or other diseases that people had in the study, it was pretty encompassing. Uh, as you can see here, there were people with asthma all the way down to people with COPD. They even included individuals individuals with HIV infection and people that are immune compromised uh, that have had um, organ transplants and things. For those of you that don't know, when you get an organ transplant, you have to be placed on immune suppressants so that your body does not reject those organs. And plenty of people that were overweight were also included, along with pulmonary fibrosis, sickle cell disease, and type 1, as well as type 2 diabetes patients. And this is one of the big advantages of this particular vaccine. Storage of it is not nearly as difficult as opposed to the actual Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. Those have to be stored in minus 70 or minus 20 degrees um, centigrade special refrigerators in order to keep it preserved. Whereas here, it can be refrigerated at 2 to 8 degrees centigrade, or that's 36 to, 46, uh, 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit for up to three months. And it can be t stored in 9 to 25 degrees centigrade, or 47 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit for up to 12 hours. Each vial, there's five doses per vial, and once it is punctured, it can be stored at 2 to 8 degrees centigrade for, or 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit for up to six hours, or a room temperature for up to two hours. 
And here is the meat of the study, basically. It showed a 66% effectiveness overall when taking into account all regions that they conducted the research by day 28 after the vaccination for moderate to severe infection. And at greater than or equal to day 28, there was overall a 85% efficacy rate against severe forms if you just look at severe and not look at moderate severe forms of COVID-19 infection and by severe forms they meant hospitalizations as well as death or needing any type of medical intervention in that regard it's almost like fine wine it gets better with time so at day 49 after the vaccination they showed 100 percent effectiveness in preventing hospitalization and death even in the South African variant and as of February 5th of 2021, when looking at the data, if you're beyond 28 days, there were seven deaths and 16 hospitalizations in the placebo group and zero deaths and zero hospitalizations. Um, sorry, that's not supposed to say placebo group. That's the uh, vaccination group. Apologize for that mistake. And as far as side effects, they are no different than the Moderna or the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine or even the flu vaccine. The most common side effects were injection site pain at 48.6%, headache at 39%, fatigue at 38%, and myalgia or muscle pain at 33%. Interestingly, uh, the side effects were lower in the vaccine group than the placebo group. So maybe a little bit of a placebo effect going on there. If you wanna learn more about that, I actually did an entire uh, video about that that I'll link in the top right hand corner as well as down in the description. The placebo effect is really interesting actually. And it is important to note that predominantly these side effects were mild to moderate. The reactions were less common if you were greater than 60 years of age. If the ages of 18 to 59 years old uh, was most frequent with mild to moderate reaction to the vaccine due to the rigorous uh, immune system that younger people have compared to those that are more elderly. And race, age, ethnicity, medical comorbidities, or prior infection was not a safety concern. And most of this resolved within the first day or two. And there were non-fatal serious adverse events of 0.4% in both the vaccine as well as the placebo group. So there you have it. Those are the details for the Johnson & Johnson Janssen COVID-19 vaccination that's been approved. And one of the questions I get asked a lot when I see patients is as this, you know, they're learning more and more about this third uh, vaccine that's been approved is whether it's better or whether, you know, they should wait and get which one they should get. In my opinion, all of these vaccines are going to give you protection from actually getting very, very sick or end up in the hospital or, you know, in the worst case scenario. If you are someone who's gonna wait for a particular vaccine as opposed to go ahead and getting whatever is available to you, and you actually got sick in between that time and something horrible happened or you have some long-term consequences from it, then that wasn't necessarily time worth waiting, right? And I mean, we're hearing more and more about, about these uh, so-called long haulers and it, uh, actually the demographic is typically a younger female that's actually very fit. What they're finding is that 25 to 30% of people that get the coronavirus, get infected with the coronavirus, end up with this long hauler syndrome and they end up with things like fatigue, uh, myalgias or muscle aches, uh, what they call brain fog, difficulty concentrating, um, increased rate of depression, insomnia, and things like that. And that they are doing a over $1 billion research study to basically look at this and try and understand this process. I'm sort of getting off topic there. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that ultimately all of the vaccines will give you protection from very severe disease. And I'm not sure that waiting for a particular vaccine is the best thing to do when one is readily available and you can get it immediately. And so, you know, with that, do with that information what you will. And as always, I suggest talking it over also with your physician and having a more detailed conversation about it. But that wraps it all up. So till next time, take care, stay safe. Bye-bye. Pura Vida.